education, like every relationship, when it's new, anything that's new that you want to do begins with hope. Hope is the driving force that pushes human beings to do anything. In a few weeks, our good friend here is going to go have surgery in hopes of removing pain from his body so he can have some rest and comfort in his mind so he can occupy himself with different things that are much more enjoyable than simply living with pain. And then you have to understand or ask yourself, is hope the station of someone who has a lot of experience or someone who doesn't have very much experience? I have a friend who lives far away from here. Uh, this person came to visit us for a number of years and then they left. And while being here, they were exposed to certain ideas. Before that, they were in relationships with various things, people, objects, ideas. And they were hopeful about almost all of them, that they're going to go to school and it's going to be exciting. They're going to get a job and that's going to be exciting. They're going to go into relationships with people, and that's going to be exciting. Hopefully, it'll lead to marriage and children and all that. And these are exciting things, and I think they are... When you're young, you need to have them. You're still journeying through life. You're trying to figure out who and what you are. You hope that the things that come into your life are going to inspire you, excite you, guide you, motivate you in some shape or form. And so, you know, hope, imagination, dream, fantasies, in addition to having resources, then you would journey towards them in hopes of bringing them to life, you know. I woke up this morning at 5, came to the office, about, got here about 5.15. I was looking so forward to making myself a cup of coffee, and I did. And I opened the fridge to see if I can put some half and half, but there was none. So part of my hope became damaged. But I enjoyed drinking black coffee nevertheless, so that was okay. But imagine if I was to go to my office with the hopes of drinking coffee, but I had run out of coffee. And then I would have to kind of figure out, what the hell am I going to do? I can't just sit here and write, or I need to drink something. And water is not fun. So hope by itself is not enough. You need resources. And resources is nothing but investment. And if you're young, and if you're dreamy, it's not very difficult. So when my friend went back to their country, They went back to school, but only to realize that they were no longer as hopeful as they once were. And then they started hanging out with their friends only to realize that the conversation is no longer as interesting. So they become, became less hopeful in gathering with their friends in hopes of having a relatively decent, exciting, meaningful conversation. Then they tried getting themselves into relationships with people, whether friendship or romantic-wise, only to realize that people don't really have much depth. And so even if they are interested in being with people, 
without depth, it's torturous. And then I got these messages from this particular person. First, it began with, it's so interesting now that I've come back only to realize that there aren't really very many things out there that are worth doing. And that insight in itself was quite inspirational for them. But then inspiration goes away and reality kicks in that I want to be with people, but they're uninteresting. I want to do things, but they're not very meaningful. And then the reality of futility and loneliness begin to set in. And the emails that used to be, thank you for the insights, transform into, I hate you, for you have ruined my life. I want to do A, but I can't, and I want to do B, but I can't. <clears throat> I'm not really quite sure what I'm looking for. Maybe I'm not looking for anything, but everything I touch turns into dust. And then now when this person emails or sends me a message in some shape or form, it's always the same. There is nothing out there that's interesting, worth doing. And that's because you know, initially you walk into life with naivete, innocence, simplicity. And as you mature and gain more experience, insights, you begin to get to know yourself a little bit better, people a little bit better, begin to understand how your own psychology works and how other people's psyche works. A bit about your culture, a bit about your society, how they impact you, how they govern you. The more you understand, the less you're able to actually enjoy. And then you have perhaps all this time and energy on your hand, but you have no idea what to invest them into because nothing is worth investing into. So let me pause and kind of just tackle your question directly and then go back to my ridiculous story. But before I tackle your question, let me go back and... When I was a very, very young man, I became friends with this very young woman, Persian, very attractive. We hung out for about, oh, four or five years. I ran into her in admissions and records building on campus somewhere. And then I said to myself, I really need to know who she is. And it was like carrot and the stick, you know, it was the donkey. I began looking for her for the next six or seven months. And eventually I found her. I heard this voice. I peeked. And there she was talking to a professor. So I waited and waited and waited. She came out, we talked, we exchanged numbers. And then uh, we went out. And the first date I remember she said to me, you know, I have MS. I had no idea what it was. Uh, multiple sclerosis. It kind of just destroys your neurons, your brain cells and your motor functions, they just kind of get destroyed. But I didn't know what it was. And I didn't care to know. I was interested in her, not so much in what she had. And you know, when you're young, you think you can endure all sorts of things. You can do all sorts of things. You can go all sorts of places and no damage will ever visit you. And then one day as we were walking, um, her face, the left side of his face just drops down. And that's what MS does sometimes. And so we go to Kaiser and we went there once a week or twice a week sometimes. 
And then I realized I can't do this anymore. My family was upset. I was young, you know. Parents desire their kids to get married to someone who is healthy. Not just healthy physically, but healthy emotionally. Healthy in the head, in the mind. And they have, of course, physical resources, like they have a good job. They have a good relationship with their parents, all sorts of things. And none of those things were true for me. I didn't have them. So my parents, rightly so, were quite upset. There came a point where I realized that the dam had broken. Something about me had cracked. I just knew I couldn't live like this. And for the next two years, I tried to look for a way out. It was difficult. Uh, and the moment I realized that most of my days are going to be spent in the hospital, I called her less. I was around her less. I was less hopeful. And of course, I knew that there was no future because I was dealing with someone who was really, really ill. And I was a young man. Uh, I had my own agendas in life. So as I got to understand the disease a bit more and how I will be within the context of this disease and how she is, possessive, angry, unstable in many ways, my hopes kind of began to decrease in intensity and eventually they just went away. So first, the more you understand, the less hopeful you become. Okay. Unless you understand a great deal and you don't have very much hope, but the other person <clears throat> exhibits lots of positive attitudes, you know, where you say, okay, I'm willing to give it a shot to see where it goes. Going back to your question, let's consider Laney College and De Anza College. You've been to De Anza College? Okay. It is one of Foothill De Anza District. It's one of the richest college districts uh, in the state, maybe even in the country. Uh, their campuses are beautiful. They really, really are. Should you and your mom, you know, at some point, find yourself in the um, Cupertino area, if it's above San Jose, just pay the visit, walk around the campus. It really, really is beautiful. Houses are very expensive. You know, if the rent down here is about 4,000, for example, rent up there is about 8,000, okay? If, for example, a part-time instructor here gets about $70, over there, they get about $120. So it's almost twice. And because students come from a relatively good background, uh, they're disciplined, they kind of come to class on time, they take notes, you start the semester with, and they're on a quarter system, so you start the semester with 40 students and you end the semester with 35, unlike Laney, where you start the semester with 40 and you end with 10, if you're lucky. You also have Cupertino and you have Oakland. You have two completely different cities. And these two cities have their own unique energies, unique set of advertisements, and so the city itself creates people, okay? Now, let's say that on the average, at Laney, out of, say, 10,000 students who go to Laney, let's say 1,000 graduate. The Anza College, out of 10,000 students, about 8,000 graduate. And you happen to have a lot of money 
and now you want to donate this money. The question is, do you want to donate that money to Lainey or do you want to donate that money to Dienza? <sighs> Ideally, you would want to donate it to a place that needs the most, which is Lainey. You know, it suffers from a good amount of poverty, physical poverty. And we walk around this campus, it's a dump. You know, look at the students. They need a good amount of attention. But you have no idea, you know, where that resource is going to go, how it's going to benefit people. If anybody knows how to use the money in the right way, just because you plant a couple of trees at Laney, just because you paint the buildings, it doesn't mean all of a sudden you have students coming in. Or are you going to dump that money in the ends of a school that doesn't really need your money, but can appreciate the fact that you've donated a few million to them? I think if you look at schools like relationships, you can kind of walk away with a more realistic picture, which is the following. You don't want to invest your time and energy in someone who has a lot of issues. And you know that it's nearly impossible to overcome those issues. You want to invest your time and energy in someone who doesn't have very many issues so they can appreciate what you give them. Does that make sense? It's best if you just pack up your stuff and go to a school that is rich in money, in culture, and in health. Because they have the resources to take care of you just in case you fall. You know, over Thanksgiving, we had about 50 people at our house. And because we respect our guests, we spend about a week cleaning the house making sure as much as possible the house is spotless. And then when people were in, we made sure that they have a lot of tea and a lot of food. And they were having a okay time. You know, you walk into this classroom, look at it. It's disorganized. You walk around campus. I'm not saying that people are not doing their best to kind of just make sure everything is cleaned up and all that, but it really resembles Oakland. It's a mess. I don't know if you pay attention when you drive to the campus. I mean, the streets are a mess, and it's no different here. And you can't really blame the school. You can't really blame the students. No one is to be blamed. The question is, it's your time, it's your energy, it's your life. The question is, how do you want to invest it? To whom do you want to give it? Which means that you have to become very, very, very selfish. Alexis, anything? Sure. We'll be right back. Yes. Do you think the rich schools have an easier time teaching students? Like maybe easier, like they come from students who don't really have to worry about food, uh, like tutors, extra because they don't get it. Their teachers don't always have like Lenny. They have tutors for students. See, when you have parents who take care of you, who like you, and uh, you have also parents whom you fear, you don't want to disappoint. Okay. And because most of these parents push their kids to go to Ivy schools, big schools with big names, you know, kids for the most part 
when you are raised in a relatively healthy environment, they have a good dose of what they call shame and guilt and then remorse, which is that I got an F in my math. And all of a sudden you realize that your father is very, very sad. And that pains you because you've caused your father to be sad. You're the reason. So what you do is you take your behind to the learning center every single day for two, three hours so that next time you show your father your math score, it's like a B or an A. And now you see your father smile and that makes you happy. When you don't have that, you don't really care whether you have an F or you have a C or you have an A. I mean, sure, I mean, there is some differences, but you don't really care. Uh, your perception of education is different. How you define success is different. How you define and view yourself is different. Uh, I'll give you an example. My sister is a pharmacist. My brother-in-law, her husband is a dentist. Naturally, they just push their kids really, really hard. I mean, in a gentle way, but they push them relentlessly. That you need to finish school. You need to get good scores. You can't go here. You can't go there. You can't do this. You can't do that. First, they're immigrants. So they value education. They value money. They value stability. They value healthy relationships. Okay? And because education, say, in the Middle East is a big thing, Naturally, Middle Eastern parents push their kids towards education. Okay. Now, when you have that push, the kid really doesn't have very many options. Okay. So they find themselves being very disciplined, wanting to prove to their parents, you know, that they can be as good as they are. In the absence of that, you have no idea where the chips are going to fall, how you're going to turn out. And now let's say you, Julian, let's say you come to my office and you say, I want to pass this class. But you haven't been here for like two, three months. What exactly do you want from me? You know, I'll give you a C. I don't have a problem giving you a C. The problem is my C is not going to do much for you. You know, I have given you an easy way out. But life is difficult, man. You know? And maybe that's one of the things about Laney. You know, you have no choice but to just push people out, to just help them graduate. You know, they will graduate from Laney, and for the most part, hopefully not, but for the most part, they'll fail in life. That's not what you get at the Enza. That's not what you get at Stanford. You know, so always um, get yourself in a school that has a big name. Always. You have cloaked your question very, very nicely, deceptively, <laughs> nicely. And um, that just goes to show how clever and cunning 
You are, which is really, really good. You need to be political in life. And reveal as little as you can. There was a movie with Bill Murray. He's not a great actor, but nevertheless, he's, a, he's decent. It's called, I think it's called The Razor's Edge. He's this rich, privileged kid. This kind of, and that's what happens when you're rich and privileged. You get bored rather easily with life. And so he decides to visit India or Tibet and see some monks and how they live. <clears throat> and... Um, when he's in this monastery, his teacher looks at him and says, it's time for you to go to, I don't know, sit at the top of the Everest. You know, it's very cool, like Antarctica. Just sit there. And he says, well, am I going to get a jacket? He says, no, no jacket. Just have this loincloth around you, and there's a book. The book will keep you warm. And he says, this is crazy. I mean, how, how can this book keep me warm? And, you know, he's simple-minded, so he assumes that because he's in a monastery and he wants to be a monk, that what the teacher is really saying is, as you're sitting in the middle of the snow and you're freezing to death, keep reading this book. And the ideas of this book will go inside you and will generate a good amount of heat, and then your body can withstand the, the freeze. And so after sitting on the snow or in the snow for like 10 hours, he realizes he's going to die. And he keeps reading, but the book isn't really that interesting. I mean, it's the Dhammapada, it's the sacred words of the Buddha. And um, he says, maybe my task is not to read the book, but burn the book. So the fire can give me some heat, and that's what he does. Anyways, and so he comes back to the States, and uh, he goes to a gathering and there is a, a woman who's in the escort business. She's a prostitute. He falls in love with her. She falls in love with him, even though she says, you know, I come from this particular background. Why do you want me? You know, your family will reject me. He says, I love you. And that's all that matters. And they begin to have a really good life together. And one day, he invites her to... His family is gathering, and his sister knows who she is. And she goes to her and whispers, I know who you are. I know your background. You don't really love my brother. You're only here because of the money and the privilege and the status. But deep down, you're still the prostitute. And she tries to tell him, I really love, my bro I love your brother. I don't care much about the money or the prestige, just the your brother himself. And the sister says no, and the damage is done. She goes back to being an escort, and then she commits suicide. Since you and I are friends, and we go way back. I'm not quite sure how you are defining what it means to be a teacher. I'm not sure what, how you're defining what it means to be a student. I'm not sure if you're using the Anza symbolically, if you're using Laney symbolically. <clears throat> Let's say De Anza stands for health. You want to quit smoking. Laney stands for someone who's been addicted to smoking. You like to quit smoking. You like to be around De Anza. And all the students who go to De Anza, they don't smoke. They don't drink. They try as much as possible to live a relatively reflective life, meaningful life. But sometimes your past comes in, haunts you, snatches you, and takes you back to, let's say, a life that you don't really enjoy, 
it pains you whenever you go back, but it's a life that's familiar to you, you're addicted to. Uh, you know what you don't like. You know what's uncomfortable, even though it may be good for you. And so your question is, what happens when you are around the Anza, you want to be around the Anza, but once in a while you get pulled back to Laini? What the hell do you do with this conflict? Or even if you're at the Anza, you keep thinking about Laini. Let me respond to your question in this way. You're healthy, at least you think you are, and so you just live your life with all sorts of assumptions about yourself, about your emotions, about how certain you are with certain things in life. And then one day you realize you have a pain somewhere in your body and you take your body to Kaiser and they say, oh, you're sorry, you're sick. And it's a serious illness. You say, well, how serious is it? You have cancer. I think it's a little too late to cure it. We can do our best, but the truth is you have cancer. Now, how you deal with this particular illness depends on how you have lived so far. If you have a long bucket list, and bucket list is nothing but a set of desires that have been unfulfilled. And those desires can either be related to your body, they can be related to your emotions, they can be related to your imaginations or intellect, or they can be related to your spiritual life. If they're related to your body, let's just say you've always wanted a Tesla or a Jaguar, or you wanted to, I don't know, hike, <clears throat> that remains an unsatisfied desire. If your emotions have to do with I wanted to make peace with my brother before he passed, or I want to make peace with my brother now, that becomes, you know, on your bucket list. If intellectually, for example, you wanted to get your PhD and teach, that remains on the bucket list. So depending on who you are, what you are, how you have lived your life, uh, your missed opportunities, the things you knew but never followed through. So how you deal with cancer, how you deal with your own demise, your own death, really depends on how you have lived. Now, let's say that you never really cared for time to reflect on this thing called time, being young, having energy. And you always imagine that you're going to live to be 90, 100, 120. And so you kind of just spend your time without reflecting how you spend it. And now when someone says that you're going to die within the next couple of years, something strange happens to you. You're not going to embrace this reality too well. You're going to fight. You're going to be angry. And first you go with denying it. No, I want a second opinion or a third or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth. Uh, it's kind of like the companion I spoke at the beginning of the class when she was told that Inside her head, there is this kind of gray cloud that the MS is spreading, and eventually she's going to lose most of her neurons. She said, are you sure? Could your machine make a mistake? You know, it's denying what's actually taking place inside you. And no one knows how long you're going to be in the denial state. Some people are there for, if they're lucky, two weeks, maybe two months, maybe two years. Some people are going to stay there for like 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Once you pass the stage of denial, you're going to find yourself in the state of anger. You're going to be angry. Why me? You know, I'm, I'm a good kid to my parents. I'm a good father. I'm a good mother. I'm a good friend. I'm a good sister or brother. You know, I've done most of the things in my life relatively well. I tried not to harm anyone. Try to live decent. And so you become angry. And again, who the hell knows how long you're going to be in the cradle of anger? Anger. Some people two months, some people 20 years. No one knows. 